Ecclesiastes chapter 9. For all this I consider in my heart, everything you've written so far, even to declare all this that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. God's in control. No man knoweth either love or hatred by all that is before them. You don't really know what the motive is. A man goes to church. You don't know why. A man is given a job. You don't know why. You know, you go up to somebody and say, you know, how you doing? Well, I'm doing well. They may not be doing well. But a man that is righteous, wise, and his works towards God is in the hand of God. God is pleased when a man does what God tells us to do. All things come alike to all. There is one event to the righteous, one, and to the wicked, two, to the good, three, and to the clean, four, to the unclean. How can we have righteous and wicked, clean and unclean, but we don't have an opposite for good? Notice that? Righteous and wicked, clean and unclean. To him that sacrifice goes to the temple, psalm is time, does what the law says to do, and to him that sacrifice not, he does not do what the law does. And yet, he has to the good, but there's nothing opposite of the good. And that sacrifice shows us in the book where we are, we're in the law. He that sweareth takes an oath as he that feareth an oath. Here's one that took that takes an oath, and here is one that, you know what? I've opened my mouth, I better do what I'm told to do. As far as the scale of one to ten, one being the worst and ten being the best of man, it's all one scale, it's one, it's all event. What there is one event, verse 2. What's that event? Death. Whether you're black, white, brown skin, yellow skin, whether you're male, you're female, whether you're old or, or young. Listen, even babies die. And there are people upwards over the age of 100, and they will die. There are homeless people who die. And then there's royalty that will die. This is an evil among all things that is done under the sun. Death. Why is death an evil? Evil can be sin. Evil may not always be sin. Evil may be the consequence of sin. What Solomon is telling us is what Paul wrote. The wages of sin is death. Just in case you thought what I said the other night about people, well, they look forward to Calvary, and we looked at that scripture, he's full of it. Solomon is writing what, 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 what Paul told us. The wages of sin is death. That's an evil. Because from the time of Genesis 2 that, that God made man and God made woman, Do you realize if there was no Genesis 3 in the Bible? We could go, let's go see great, 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 great Grandpa Adam. And we'll visit grandma, great, 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 great Grandma Eve. There would be no death if there was no Genesis chapter 3. 
death came by rebelling against the word of God, for the day thou shalt eat of the fruit thereof, and I'm not quoting, not quoting completely, thou shalt surely die. Solomon and Paul is telling us that death is an evil. It's a consequence because of sin. In the eternal life, all those that were before the law, all those that during the law, all those during the gospels, all those during the church age, all those during the tribulation period, all those during the millennial, all those that have done what God has told them to do to earn the salvation of their dispensation will go up to New Jerusalem, the new heavens and the new earth, and like I preached today on the streets, they'll never die again. And why will you not die in, in heaven, new Jerusalem, new earth, or new heaven? Because there is no more sin. The wages of sin is death. When God takes away the sin by the Lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world, there's no more consequence of sin, death. Notice how he says, this is an evil among the things that are done under the, under the sun, not in heaven. What about hell? The Bible says in Revelation 20, death and hell were cast in the lake of fire and, and hell emptied herself and they stood before God. This is the second death as you go into the lake of fire. Now, how does Solomon know that? Solomon knew what, what, what the, the, the wages of sin is death. Solomon knew that somehow there was a second death. But Solomon didn't know about Calvary. I don't know what you're going to say, but let's keep reading. That there is one event, death, unto all. Even God, Jesus Christ, died. That's the gospel. Jesus Christ suffered and died, according to scriptures. Yea, also... The hearts of the sons of men, humans, is full of evil. And madness is in their heart while they live. Every man is capable of being an Adolf Hitler. And every woman is capable of being a Jezebel. Look at Genesis 6.5. Genesis 6 5. Even born again, saved Christian. Genesis 6 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And then we'll come over to uh, Genesis chapter 8, verse 21, after the flood, and the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the, the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. That's after the flood. That's after the judgment. It's in the heart. Shrinks and psychologists and school counselors don't deal with what the Bible says is the trouble. It's a heart condition, not a head condition. While they live. After that, they go to the dead. That's what verses 2 and 3 have been all about, the dead. You can be right, you can be wrong, you can be righteous, you can be wicked. You can do evil things. You can be mad. You're still going to die. For to him that is joined to all the living, there is a hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion.
What's he saying? He's been saying, you know, he's, he's cursed his birthday. He said, oh, I just wish death. What Solomon's coming to the conclusion here is, you know what? In the grave, not hell, not he heaven, not Abraham's bosom, but what I can see under the earth, I look at a grave, I look at a corpse. A dog has more purpose and more being alive than a dead lion. Dogs were scavengers during, they weren't pets. They ate garbage, that and pigs. There was a time in America, in early America, in New York City, dogs and pigs ran rampant in the street and they ran rampant eating the trash. You would throw your trash out, out the window or out the door. And there would be a use for a lion. A lion would get rid of some animals that you didn't want around, but the dead lion, he ain't doing no more good. The dog, he's eating the garbage. He's doing good. When you're a dead corpse, you ain't doing no good. That's why Jesus Christ came out of the grave three days and three nights according to Scripture. Jonah didn't no, do no good because he died in the whale. He did not live. He didn't have a cavity. That's another Pharisee of the liars of, of scholarship. Jonah had no purpose dead and in hell with his body in that whale. He had a purpose when God resurrected that body and the whale puked him out on the beach and he went to Nineveh and preached. When a man has a dead Christianity and he doesn't tell people about Jesus, but he'll tell about the world, he's a dead lion. There's no purpose for him. Though that man lives and does stupid, worldly, garbagey things at the judgment seat of Christ, he ain't going to get nothing. For, okay, now verse 5. For the living know that they shall die. That's why health care and, and insurance, that's why they make tons of money. I don't want to die, I want to prepare before I die. But the dead know not anything, and they don't. Neither have they any more a reward. Once a Christian dies, his gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, or stubble, that's it. What you done, you done. What you didn't do, you didn't do. Okay? For the memory of the, them is forgotten. When the dead die, they don't know. But we got a problem with scriptures. Now, verse 5 is the Jehovah Witness proof text of soul sleep. When you die, you just go off to the grave and you lay in the grave. That's it. That's their proof text. What have we been teaching about the book of Ecclesiastes? Is there a eternal life? Not in the book of Ecclesiastes there is. Everything done under the sun. Now, it'd be okay if you got a new world translation. But Solomon, under no direct revelation of God, we have a problem. He says the dead has no memory. Okay. Luke. And I know it's in Luke. Luke. 16. The dead has no memory. 
With the Gospel of Luke able to be opened in my lap, Luke 16, verse 28. The man is dead, for I have five brethren that they may testify unto them. Solomon didn't have the book of Luke or Gospel of Luke. Solomon don't have the teachings of Jesus Christ. And scholars are going to say that Solomon knew about Calvary. He didn't even know about what the man in health. He said the man that dies has no memory. And yet Solomon's correct. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, Stiley. You just said Luke 16, the rich man in health said, My, I got five brethren. Okay? What the Jehovah Witness don't understand, what's in the grave? The body. What's in hell? The soul. What is returns back to God? We've already studied the book of Ecclesiastes. The spirit. Man is a body, soul, and spirit. Solomon's looking at the body. He's not looking at the soul. That's how you answer that. When Jesus tells us about the rich man in hell, Luke 16, he's telling us about the soul. Yeah, there is... No, there's not a soul sleep. There's a body sleep, not a soul sleep. Uh, this one, First Thessalonians or Second Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter four. Verse thirteen. We're not going to read about the whole thing. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Those that have died in Christ. What is sleeping? What's he been talking? What's he going to talk about 13 through 18? Talk about that body coming out of the grave. You see, the Jehovah Witnesses, the devil. Never mind the Jehovah Witnesses, the devil takes a truth and he twists it. There is a sleeping in the grave, but it's not your soul. There is your body, your skin, your muscle, your fat, your bones, your hair, your, your nails are sleeping in the grave, not your soul. So when Solomon writes to us the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 5, he's telling us the body, not the spirit. He's already talked about the spirit. He says the spirit goes back to God. Solomon doesn't know about the soul to a point. And what he knows is David, his father, slept with his father. That means they took the body of David and they buried it with the other family members where their bodies are. There is a body sleeping in a cemetery, but their souls are not sleeping in the graveyard. Their souls are very alive in Abraham's bosom that is now emptied. Or in to be absent today and absent from the body and present with the Lord. The body stayed. How do I know? I've had two wives that were saved die. And they died and their body stayed, but their soul went to be with the Lord. What the Pharisee, I mean, what the, what the deceiving teaching of the Jehovah Witnesses, well, the soul has to be in that body when it dies. Incorrect. The body's there, but the soul is not. And when Solomon tells us he has no more memory, and Jesus says that the rich man in hell says, I've got five brethren. Okay, now we got a contradiction. No, we don't. 
Solomon, the body doesn't remember nothing no more. The soul does. There it is. When you're half wrong, you are wrong. Also, their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Now he's talking about an evil man, a wicked man. Or is he? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth, believeth, whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Solomon don't know about that. Solomon is not talking about the soul. He's talking about the dead corpse. There is evidently, though there's no love in hell, that rich man said, I got five brethren. I don't want them to come here. That rich man who had servants in his lifetime, that rich man had the nerve to give Abraham orders. And Abraham's the father of the faith and the father of, of the Jews. You get what that rich man did to Abraham? Have him send me a drop of water. Why don't you send him to my... He's still ordering. Now you may ask a dead body questions. It ain't going to answer you. But if the rich man retained his characteristics as... I'm the rich man, you're the servant. That which you love goes with you into hell, into hell. He said, I got five brethren. Now don't we say, like I said, I've got two wives that were saved and gone off to glory. Am I not going to rejoice when I see them before Jesus Christ? My body, okay, it, it, it's gone. It's dead. It's going to be resurrected one day. But me and that rich man that went to hell, we've got family we remember. Why else would God have to dry our tears after the great white throne judgment? If we don't realize that's our family, friend, and co-workers are being cast off in the lake of fire. Hatred. Oh, wouldn't it be interesting to get to glory? And I don't know what, what heaven's going to be like, but there's that Christian was in our church, and I hate him because he he served the Lord, and he was a he was a religious geek. He was he was a Jesus freak, and look at all the crowns he's got, and I got none. See the word envy? Now, envy is a sin. What do you do when you're walking the streets of the street of New Jerusalem and there's a guy you hated in church because he loved the Lord and did right and he's got crowns and he had an inheritance in the millennium and you got squat? How about this one? You got a preacher in the pulpit, and there's that guy out there sitting in the pew. How dare he tell me? And at the judgment seat of Christ, God has told you, the preacher, you're wrong. And that man that sat in the pulpit was correct. And as a preacher, you have no rewards. That man that sat in the pew, he's got rewards. How do you walk in heaven? Crowns, no crowns. 
And yet the man in hell knew, hey, I got five brethren. And God shall wipe away our tears after the great white throne judgment. How about this one? Oh, I'm going to go into chopping block now, and then we're going to move on. Well, you know your ministry wasn't. You didn't get a lot of people saved. I got some. God got some increase, but not as much as me. And the people I did witness to and the people that did get saved, Let's say many that made a profession under my care are at the judgment seat of Christ. They're saved. And some of them ended up to the great white throne judgment. But, you know, it was them that believed false. I didn't do any false teaching to get them saved. All right. And you and your miraculous ways of calling the masses to say a prayer. We got eight saved this time. We got 20 saved this time. Oh, there were just people just saying the prayer. And what do you do when the few that be the many that are in heaven because you didn't do well enough. And they're going to be forever hugging me because I obeyed God. And we'll be singing together to the joy of the Jesus Christ that saved our soul. And you and your masses of people saying a prayer, you watch them depart from me, workers of iniquity. I never knew you but when your fingertips are filled with blood. It'd be better for a man to tie a millstone about his about his about his neck and to be cast off in the ocean than to deceive. And you go into glory, New Jerusalem. You deceive many people. They thought they were walking the straight gate, but they were actually walking the broad way. But you had them to leave. They were walking the wrong path. I won't be in that shoes. I don't know how much we're going to retain in heaven. I don't know. I do know that I have two wives there. My, my three children are going to be there. I have a grandma and grandpa that are there. My mom's going to be there. Peter, without ever meeting Moses and Elijah, said, hey, there's Moses and Elijah. The rich man thought he was a servant. I mean, the rich man thought he was rich and had servants. The rich man knew he had five brothers. Now, when we look at the book of Ecclesiastes, we're looking at a dead corpse. We're not looking at the soul. And you're not going to do rounds with the Jehovah Witness. Because as you tell them, oh, under the sun, you know, light, and, and then they got there. They're not going to listen. Unless you got a very young Jehovah Witness. But that is the Pharisee lying story of the Jehovah Witnesses. Yeah. When a man dies, not his soul sleeps, his body sleeps. His soul is in heaven or his soul is in hell. And now... Perished. John 3 16 says, If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't perish. 
He that has the Son has everlasting life. That he that has not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God. Abide in your body. Solomon don't know that. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Is David dead, his father? Yes, David is dead. Is not David going to sit prince under the king, Jesus Christ? Is not David going to be in the promised land with his throne being seated by the Messiah? Solomon does not have that revelation. So when you go into the book of Ecclesiastes and charge in there with eternal thoughts and, and, and that's not what you do with this book. It's everything under the sun. David and Solomon will be resurrected and in the promised land. Solomon's going to have, listen, God said Solomon's going to be my son. Solomon's going to have as much as all the Jews in, in the law period that get to go into the, to Jerusalem through Jesus Christ. Man, they're going to have great things. Do you realize how much better the kingdom of Jesus Christ is going to be better than the kingdom of Solomon? Solomon said he planted trees, correct? Solomon said he planted vineyards, correct? Did Solomon have to weed those vineyards? Yes, he had to weed. Did Solomon have crops that failed? Yes. There's no weeds and there's no crop failure in the millennium. Not, not there. Solomon is looking at, he's not wrong, he's looking at it through a man that is living under the sun as a live man. I told you, I, I use the word very, I don't even know how to say it. The book of Ecclesiastes is a holy philosopher's book that life. You can't go running into eternal doctrine in this book. Jehovah Witnesses have and failed. Going thy way. I mean, go thy way. Eat thy bread with joy. You earned it. There's no one. Eat, drink, and be merry of the five I gave you last night. Drink thy wine. The man that wrote Proverbs that was against alcohol beverages. You think now in the book of Ecclesiastes he's going to say, drink intoxicating liquor? The book of Proverbs is at least three years, we'll say ten, just a round number, ten years before he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. You think it within three to ten years, all right, go ahead and have intoxicating liquor. You think the Holy Spirit would have put that in there? Great juice. Drink wine with a merry heart. That doesn't mean intoxicate. I showed you in the book of Ruth, chapter 3. And many people say that Boaz was intoxicated. As smart as that man was, there's your eat, drink, and be merry. Can I show you something that many people don't See, in this intoxicating, go thy way, eat thy bread. Take of you this bread, this is the body of my, of my body, which will be broken for, for all of you. With joy. And drink thy wine. Take this cup, this, this cup is the blood of the New Testament. Which will be shed for many. A merry heart. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness. 
And how the, the fruit of the spirit of a man gets by being saved. Love, joy, peace. For God now accepteth thy works. Are we saved by works? We're not of works, least any man both. For by grace are you saved through faith. Solomon didn't know he was writing about the Lord's Supper. But look at the Lord's Supper there. The broken body and the, and the blood of Jesus Christ brings us a merry heart and salvation. God will set the works of Jesus Christ, not my works. Let thy garments be always white. Keep yourself clean and unspotted. Fine linen is the righteousness of saints. I can go to church with a suit and tie, and get it dry clean, shine my shoes, and clean up brand new underwear, and and so I can be as filthy and deceivable heart as listen. A suit does not make you. The body, soul, and spirit that's in that suit is what makes your character. I have met many people in a suit that got up before a pulpit and a podium and out of the Bible. And they're deceivers. And they're wolves. Thy, it says, God shall now accept thy word. Now keep your garments clean. That's Old Testament works, not church age. Nehemiah's got a problem. Nehemiah is not going to heaven. Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter. It's good to know your Bible. Oh, right I don't know why. It is. I don't remember it anymore. But this is one of the first verses I remembered being a Christian. It just struck my heart and I gotta find it. Oh. Alright. Nehemiah 4, 23. They're under the law. The law lasted it to John the Baptist and then Jesus Christ. So neither I, nor my brethren, nor my servants, nor the men of the guard which followed me, none of us put off our clothes, saving that everyone put them off for washing. I guarantee Nehemiah, they're building that wall, they didn't have their garments white. Solomon doesn't know about Nehemiah. Solomon doesn't even, Solomon doesn't even know his temple is going to be destroyed, but he knows about Calvary. Really? Solomon doesn't even know that a thousand wives are going to turn his heart against Jesus. Well, you know, the scriptures. The scriptures told Solomon in the law, don't multiply gold, don't go back to Egypt, don't multiply horses, and for sure, don't multiply wives. And let thy head lack no ointment. I mean, it's something they had to do in that climate, the hot sun. It, it wasn't makeup. It was. It was a remedy. For your skin in that sun. Well, let's, we'll skip verse nine because a lot of a lot of Christians can't do verse nine. Live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of thy life. That woman. I, I, I tell people, I, I want the Lord to give me another wife. And you don't want to be married. And then they speak ill of their wife. And when they speak ill of their wife, they're not, oh, I'm a Christian. Live joyfully with the wife. That's a man who had a thousand wives. You have read about his, his husbandly, order 
set forth in the book of Proverbs. You have read what Paul tells the Christians in the church, hey, the love, husbands love your wives, be not bitter against them. Husbands love your wives as Christ so loved the church and gave himself. For. You read that, right? That mean, nasty women that preachers get up in the pulpit and have a ha-ha funny story about marriage. <laughs> uh, the wife leads the husband and the husband's this little, he, he does little funny things, or those little, God will mark you as wood, hay, and stubble for, listen, there's two things that God gave Adam. He gave him to go work in the garden and he gave him a wife. And Jesus Christ and Paul quoted Adam in Genesis chapter 2 on what the man is to do for his wife. And it's not mock her. It's not mock marriage. It's not make fun of it. It's not mockery. You're to live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest in a worldly carnal book. Imagine what Paul wrote to the churches. And worldly. Hey, writing under the sun. All the days of thy life are thy vanity. Your life is vanity. You got that wife there? She's not vanity. You love her and joyfully love her. Christian husbands treat their wife as vain. Wood, hay, or stubble. You don't like that one either. Which he has given, which he has given thee under the sun. You know, Solomon said in the book of Proverbs, I quote to God looking for a wife. Lord, whosoever finds a wife obtains favor of the Lord. I quote that to God. God, I want another favor. You've given me two great favors. I need a third one. God said, live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest the days of, the, of thy life. That life is vanity. Which he, God, has given thee under the sun. That wife came from God. Oh, you married a woman that didn't come from God? That is your fault. You didn't hear to the Bible. Mm-hmm. For this is the portion of this life, the wife. And in thy labor, which taketh under... Man should work for a living. Man doesn't work, he ought not to eat. How are you doing with your wife? Are you joyful? Uh, well. <laughs> if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I've been married twice. My first wife, my first marriage, my first wife was wonderful and great. She died and went, went home to be with the Lord. My second marriage, there was difficulties, there were problems. But I loved my wife and joyfully spent the time with my wife. She didn't, she left the Lord. And I don't say anything mean about both my wives. I, what I do have to say, I say to my pastor, because we're talking about things, we're in counseling, I only say it's the truth, and that needed to be said for what we're counseling about. Other than that, no one else knows anything. What do you say about your wife? I thank God for him, and I'm ready for a third one. What a Christian man! Hey, I'm married. You don't want to be married. Yeah, that's the most rot. That's the most terrible thing. <laughs> and you're giving me counsel, and I bet you don't even read your Bible. And you're trying to give me godly counsel, and you don't live joyfully with your. Shut up! Shut up! Don't say any other words if you're not going to live joyfully with your wife. Because that's scripture. 
You got anything else to say? I'll tell you what you say. Shut up. Okay? That's why people don't like me. I'm right to the point, and I will tell you what the Bible says. Plain and simple.